in the dense forests of Kentucky. It was my first instinct, I was scared. Lives a monster that has been terrifying campers. It has been linked to fatal attacks. It does seem to just kill for pleasure. And killing cattle for pleasure. The face off, the ears were off, the tongue was out. It's an aggressive creature. Locals call it Barilla. Now guys, if I say run, y'all run. Kentucky, a small rural state nestled in the eastern center of the United States, famous for its horse racing, bourbon, and bluegrass music. American history is never far away here. It is in this state that we find the forests of Daniel Boone and small wooden houses of the pioneers. The era of the early settlers has long passed, but nature still dominates this landscape. For centuries, locals have been told that the forest hides aggressive, potentially lethal creatures. The last on this list, the Barilla, a biped with werewolf-like features. I'm Jason Caldwell, I'm 31 years old. I've lived in Mount Sterling, Kentucky my whole life. I like to hunt, fish, and take care of my kids. I'm, my name is Jeff Caldwell, and I'm his father. Got a great son here, I'm really proud of him. It's been 15 years since Jason saw Barilla. The encounter has haunted him ever since. Well, Jason, he always has been a hunter, you know. After this, he's uncomfortable being in the woods now by himself, you know, and I can understand why, you know. Summer 99, me and five other guys camping. Um, I was gonna graduate in a couple years, and we had a fishing trip planned the next day, you know. So we was gonna be up early, no drinking that night at all. You know, it was just good, clean fun. We go to sleep, three of us stay in the truck, Three of us sleep in the tent, it's a small tent. Uh, guys hear something, wake me up, and says something's around the tent. Open up the tent and look. I seen it 40 yards away, tall, six foot, six and a half, seven foot tall, gray, silver like creature. You know, it wasn't a human like face, a, a little bit of a long muzzle, and then it was gone. It was just an, a feeling I've never felt, you know, seeing something like that. Um, the other guys immediately had fear. I had fear after, you know, I told them what I had seen. They was ready to go like I was. And, uh, you know, the other guys was with us. They wasn't in the tent. They didn't get to see it. They didn't believe us. But we left. You know, we got out of there. So we haven't been camping back there again. You know, I, I believe what he said, you know, because, well, in 96, I was, uh, was coming home from a coon hunting competition about 4.30 in the morning. and. Uh, I come around a road and in a curve and there was something come off the road, you know, and cross the road, about six, seven foot tall, you know, and it had a sort of a muzzle like pointed ears, and, or silver like brown, you know, just different colors. And then I just swerved over and then it just turned and went off over the hill, you know, and I'm gone and it's gone. Who's gonna make up a story like that, you know? And I thought maybe, you know, it's somebody you know, maybe dressed up in a, you know, an ape suit or something, but 4.30 in the morning, you know, on a, on a road that's in Clark County, Kentucky, and, you know, who would be out that far? You know what I'm saying? Just nobody. I stay in the woods, you know, I never see, you know, deer won't come close to us. Um, raccoons wouldn't make that kind of racket. There was nobody else down in them woods. Um, you know, I have no explanation for what it was. So it just prompted me to do more research, and that's when I found out about Barilla. The town of Mount Sterling lies at the base of the Appalachian Mountains. Founded in 1790, it boasts 7,000 residents, every one of them proud of their history. My name is Chip Manley. I'm a local high school history teacher here in Mount Sterling, Kentucky. This was in many ways kind of a, a trading center founded mostly by Scots, Irish, and English settlers who came here. Most people that are here trace their ancestry back quite a bit here in Kentucky, descendants of a lot of those early settlers uh, that came through here. Camping, hunting, very popular pastimes here in Montgomery County. 
kind of a rite of passage for uh, for young people to have those skills passed on to them from uh, from their fathers and grandfathers. Uh, well, here in Montgomery County, we're not very far from the Daniel Boone National Forest. A lot of that is very much uh, almost virgin forest. You still have a real glimpse into what Kentucky looked like 300, 400 years ago before all the settlement came in. In Kentucky, there have been a lot of cryptid sightings reported in the last uh, several decades of Barilla, literally from one end of the state to the next. Once you get outside of the cities and the small towns, you quickly run into a lot of just open farmland, a lot of wilderness, especially to the east of here. So for things to, to live in those areas outside of the usual traffic of, of humans here in Kentucky, it's quite possible that uh, every now and again their paths intersect with those creatures in the wilderness. In these isolated areas, everyone has something to say about the rumors of monsters lurking in the forest. Most people have heard the stories because the stories go way back in history in Kentucky. My mother has old stories of seeing uh, creatures in the woods. I tell my grandkids all the time, there are not no such thing as monsters. Well, it was, it's been about a year ago, I was driving home. I seen something go across the road in about four steps. It was just just outside of where my headlights would reach, so I just kind of got a glimpse of it. There's some wild bear and normal things, but no gorilla. It was dark in color, uh, very large, probably seven, eight foot tall. If he says there's a burillo, he's pulling your leg. <laughs> you know, I say it was very large, so it's I've never seen nothing like that there. I can't say that it was a barilla, but I can't really tell you what it was. I don't know, it might have been me. I'm the meanest thing in Mount Sterling. <laughs> In Kentucky, if you think you've seen a monster or the paranormal knocks on your door, it's Ron Coffey you'd call to the rescue. Hey, my name's Ron Coffey. I started this 40 years ago. We were considered kooks. <laughs> I am Lori Coffey. I am the wife of Ron Coffey. He's a cryptozoologist known worldwide for studying the barilla. Cryptozoology means it's an animal that is known but unidentified. And once it becomes identified, then it becomes into the field of zoology. Ron and I started the Gateway Paranormal Society back in 2008. Together, Ron and I researched uh, Bigfoot and the Loch Ness Monster. And I'm sure that the Barilla, the Bigfoot, and all that one day will be known, but right now we don't know what they are. The Barilla, however, I um, let Ron handle. It's more aggressive than any of the other cryptids we've encountered. According to Ron, you need a certain amount of background information to better understand the Barilla phenomenon. Well, first off, the name. How did it get that name? Back in 1972, a farmer saw it walk across the road in front of him, described as solid white, long-haired, rather hunched over. But anyway, he was the first person to actually go to the media about it in 1972. And the only words he could think of to describe it was it's half bear and half gorilla the news media picked up and called it the Barilla. So that's how it got to be the Barilla. And then there's a whole rash of uh, sightings along about that time. Most people just describe it as basically a, people use the word werewolf as being the best description. And I, I hate to use that word because people automatically get the wrong idea. I don't believe in werewolves, not in the traditional sense, but that's the description most people give. It looks like a werewolf. Aside from minor differences, witness testimonies are remarkably consistent. The Barilla is described as being about two meters tall, with a coat of black and silver fur, able to move on two or four legs. It has a wolf-like face, long, menacing arms, and sharp claws and teeth. If you see one, run. It was during his childhood, on a terrifying summer night spent in the woods, that Ron Coffey's quest began. Cousins and I were someplace we weren't supposed to be, of course. We saw what looked like a very large dog walking on all fours toward us. He comes up on two legs and lets that kind of a screech, howl type sound. It was tall, 
had very long pointed ears, the real long, elongated snout, and actually begins to chase us on two legs. Chase is probably about 20 feet, and then it veered off into a little trail back into some brush and disappeared. But it moved very quick, and it was very adept on two legs. A bear doesn't move that way. A dog doesn't walk on two legs. So it had to have been something totally different to what we're used to. And of course, we went back and told everybody we saw a werewolf. Of course, everybody said he was crazy, but you know, we were just kind of laughed at. And so, you know, that was the end of that, of that story. We never, never saw it again. When we get together to this day, we still talk about that. <laughs> so, yeah, it, it stuck with all of us. Since then, Ron Coffey has never stopped looking for the monster. In 2012, Barilla resurfaced in the region. Actually, a bit north of here in Wadi, there were reports in 2012 of a string of violent attacks. I'm a freelance reporter, and I worked at the Mount Sterling Advocate, a local newspaper here in Kentucky, for three years. There were just a lot of farm animals were mauled. It was over and over the same type of attack. It was the face off, the ears were off, the tongue was out. I think it was over like a span of five weeks that this happened. Um, none of them were eaten, just mostly just viciously attacked like it was almost for sport. So whatever the creature was that did this didn't really leave very much, many traces behind. So it was just confusing um, to the residents. All the attacks happened at night, and so nobody really got a good look at it. People were very afraid. Um, a lot of people were um, taking extra measures to lock up their animals at night. Um, a lot of people weren't letting their children play outside. It did create a lot of panic in the area for months and months after, after the attacks. Um, I've spoken with some, a local cryptozoologist about the incidents, and um, I know that he's very credible, in my opinion, and he, uh, he's he sort of related it to what could possibly be known as a barilla. In his 40 years of research, Ron has studied dozens of cases of bloody attacks attributed to barilla. The barilla's got a real habit of being able to disappear. It's an aggressive creature. Really the first modern sighting happened actually in 1944. A teenage boy was fishing, and it actually tried to take his fish. And he described some creature came up out of the bank. He described it as large, wolf-like silver gray hair so he put up a fight with the thing now he lost <laughs> he said it turned around and actually grinned at him <laughs> and walked on off with the fish but he had to be treated at a hospital for deep lacerations and the way we know this happened was some of the hospital employees actually leaked this information out the only fatal attack of a human occurred in 1981 it never was officially listed in any newspapers. It leaked out actually just kind of a, by word of mouth from the people who originally responded. The police found a camper. Door ripped off, blood smeared on the camper, and they found remains of people, not whole bodies, remains of people. Uh, one of the hands was clutching a handful of gray, grayish hair. And they actually found the girl too. She was up in a tree about you know, 20, 30 feet up in a tree hanging over a branch what was left of her. And the tree bark had the same grayish uh, color hair that was in the hand. And then it just basically uh, stored us dried up. And some of the original responders have said that they were actually threatened by government officials not to tell anything they had seen because actually the whole economy of that area is based on that recreational area. You know, you wouldn't want something like that to get out. That would not be good for the economy. And like, so that's the only one where it's been really implicated and it could have been a murder of humans. The history of Kentucky is closely linked to the great American pioneers and their westward expansion. The best known of them is Daniel Boone, who is to this day a local hero. The people of Kentucky have a love of nature and adventure in their blood. I'm Miles Hoskins. I'm the president of the Montgomery County Historical Society here in Mount Sterling, Kentucky. Kentucky was actually opened up probably by the uh, French Canadians. They came in here as early as 1650. They were probably coming down with the Iroquois Nation into Kentucky to trap beaver fur and, and do early exploration. Not much went on until about 1767 or so when Boone traveled all over the eastern part of Kentucky. Uh, and he was, he was a noted Indian fighter. He was captured and lived with the Indians for some time. And 
Uh, they called him Big Turtle. They gave him an Indian name. And, but but his, his basic role in Kentucky was more or less leading people in here. He, he was the one that really got people fired up about coming to Kentucky. Boone led many folks through the Wilderness Trail into Kentucky and is generally regarded as one of our great pioneers for settlements. Most of the people probably came into Kentucky in those early days. Some were literate, some weren't. So their oral histories had to be pretty important to them. At the time of the pioneers, when most of the U.S. territory was still unexplored, stories circulated about the dangers of the forest. The, the folks that settled this region, the Scots, the Irish, the English, they brought their superstitions, their legends, their folklore here with them. When you have settlers that came into this region and had to clear out the forest in order to create the cities and towns that we have today, that forest was always at the edge. Uh, that forest and, and what was out there was always kind of at the edge of civilization. When it got dark, it was dark. And there's, there's always something that goes bump in the night. And I'm sure Kentucky had its share of myths and tales, uh, just like all civilizations done since the dawn of man. And I think in many ways, the presence of the forest, the, the unknown in the forest, really has an effect upon Kentucky even still today. According to Ron Coffey, the legend of Barilla has its roots in the many cultures that have passed through Kentucky. Now, they've got legends of all different sorts, but the physical description is the same in every single legend. The Native Americans had legends through this whole area, the Shawnee, Delaware, Iroquois. They all spoke of this same creature they called the Lemican. Go a little farther north, the Native Americans of that region called it a Wendigo. And then you had out west, you had the same creature, but the Navajos called it the Skinwalker. And of course, basically described, just like all the modern sightings are, and it was when the French people settled up in the Great Lakes area. They brought with them the legend of the Loup Garou, which is the French werewolf. These combined with the stories of the Lemican and the Wendigo, which then created basically an American Loup Garou. Native Americans didn't sit around and make up stuff just to mess with people. It, they reported what they see. So if the Native Americans speak of it, it has to be real, plain and simple. They don't make, they don't add on, they don't take away, it is what it is. So I think it's several legends combined with the sightings of a flesh and blood animal that didn't quite fit into the sequence of known, known animals, and then the legends have sprung up around that. But definitely whenever you have the same story repeated over and over and over again, it definitely kind of makes you wonder, um, what if something like that really exists? We heard stories of strange events uh, growing up, and it was just something that was part of uh, the local folklore, the tradition, really, uh, of growing up in Kentucky. And so stories that our grandparents will tell, would tell us, um, you know, around the dinner table, those are just stories that we kind of take to heart. I think mystery is a really big part of Kentucky, and I think that's just because there's a lot of rich history that goes back here. Um, I think a lot of it is just steeped in tradition, really takes stock in folklore here, so. You know, I don't care how well you pass it on. Things get left out, things get added, and never let the truth stand in the way of a good story. <laughs> so. Today, Kentucky is world-renowned for its bourbon, but the production of alcohol had humble beginnings with moonshine, a strong drink that almost certainly loosened tongues and accompanied fireside storytelling. Small moonshine was just kind of, it was just spirits. It was corn liquor, is what they called it. They would just uh, use corn, distill it down, mix in some sugar, and get that baby going. And uh, when it ran through the worm and uh, out the tube, it, out came this clear liquid that uh, you could clean your car with. <laughs> of course, after Prohibition came in, in in the 20s, people started opening, putting their stills back in the woods, and and they ran moonshine by the light of the moon. So when the moon was shining, they would go out and make their liquor because they could see what they were doing. So it, it kind of got its connotation from that. Uh, it would oil up the mind and the tongue both. And uh, so I think uh, it probably did play a, a lot of legends grew out of moonshine and a lot of reputations I'm sure grew out of moonshine. <laughs> uh, yes, some people are intoxicated and some people are mentally ill, but everybody does not fall in that category. 
and enough people have talked about it and seen it and described the exact same creature. It makes me believe it has to be real. During a camping trip in 1999, Jason Caldwell saw what he believed to be a barilla. But the five other campers present that night don't share his opinion. That's the case with his best friend. Well, my name's Gary Hobbs. Me and Jason have known each other a long time. Well, we decided we were going camping, and uh, next thing I know, shortly after we fell asleep, you know, they come to the truck saying, we need to get out of here. You could just tell Jason was freaked out, like, you know, he was, he saw something. You know, I seen what I seen, and I was ready to get out of here. When he came to the truck, I mean, he was, you could tell he was really freaked out. I mean, he he had saw or heard something to where he wanted to leave. And it, that's not, wasn't normal, because he's an outdoors type person. You know, he he loved to go camping. You know, he loves to hunt, he loves to fish. So it's not normal for him to want to leave, you know, just all of a sudden, you know? So it just, it freaked me out, was my first instinct. I was scared, because I could tell that he was freaked out. So I just jumped in the truck. Well, after I started to wake up a little bit and come to my senses, I thought he was full of crap. Even the guys that were in the tent with him, you know, they didn't see it. They, they heard some noises, but they didn't see it like he did. So I think they, they kind of felt like he was crazy. It did cross my mind that he just maybe saw, you know, through the dark something, you know, his mind playing tricks on him or. You know, if my mind was playing tricks on me, three of us wouldn't have heard what we heard, the footsteps that went around us, you know, the crunching of the leaves and the and the timber and, and looking out and seeing what I saw. You know, all three of us, I got to, got to hear it, but only one visual. Yeah, but the wind could have blew something across in front of the tent or something. Nah, it, I mean, it. you know, it was clearly something walked past us. I mean, another animal. Maybe it's it, something looking for food. Nothing that big. There is nothing with that kind of stature in these woods. You know, the color of the coat and the height of it, you know, it was definitely just a barilla. Well, I mean, like I said, he stuck to his story. I believe he, he saw or heard something. In my mind, it was just an animal. I'm just one of those persons, I guess, I can't believe it unless I actually see it. I'm the type of person that I believe anything until I have a reason not to believe. Yeah, we butted heads a lot because of that fact. Sometimes I think he's full of crap. I don't know, I still have my doubts. Ron Coffey has acquired a solid understanding of Barilla's way of life, and he's happy to share with those who believe in the existence of the monster. Uh, Jason, you saw uh, something strange up at Barlow Ridge? Yes. Okay, did it look anything like this? Yeah, from the back, you know, it definitely looked like that. Mm -hmm. You know, six and a half foot, seven foot maybe. Okay. Are you willing to go with me to show me about where you saw this and just try to scout it out? Maybe we can see it again? You oh, yeah. Do that? Yeah. Okay. So there's been several sightings back in that area. Hopefully, we can find some tracks or something, some, some good proof of this. I'm feeling kind of excited, you know, to, to see if we might find something, might see something. Just never know what might happen, what you might see. Well, we don't need anything fancy for this. First thing, we're going to take some plaster of Paris in it. Hopefully, we'll be able to find some tracks or something of this uh, barilla and pour this out into the track, and we'll have to let it sit. We're going to put this trail cam up where we start because these things have a habit sometimes. When you're out looking for them, they're actually following you. So maybe we can catch it as it's following us because I know a lot of people have looked, and then when they come back, they find its track imposed on their track. So we're going to try to catch it if it follows us if we find any strange hair. Pick it up with tweezers. Put it in glass. Don't touch it with your fingers. The camera. In the video camera. This is the way I've done it for 40 years. And I've, this worked fine for me. And we are ready to roll. We'll follow you, Jason. As his wife, I worry about him. It has been linked to several fatal attacks throughout the country, and uh, so it's, it, it's, it's a baddie, you know. I've been accused of having more courage than I had common sense, but I've never I've really been in fear of anything. But the area we're going to now has had a lot of uh, different encounters, and so maybe we'll get lucky. 
he respects this this creature um, for its aggressiveness, and he's he's always cautious when pursuing it. This creature, we'll use caution on. It does have a, a history of aggression. It's a dangerous creature. People tell me what's the best way to stay safe, and I say, don't be stupid. Just don't be stupid. Any animal is going to defend itself, and that's that's just nature. So basically, just. Use common sense anytime you're out. He's not really scared of anything. He's good at what he does. He really is. It was in the Daniel Boone National Forest that Jason had his barilla encounter. This evening, Jason and Ron will face their fears together on the hunt for this terrifying monster. This vast forest, protected by the US government, is seldom visited the perfect hiding place for Barilla. Golly, I've never seen it this thick. Maybe 30 yards is when I seen Barilla walking off. Obviously, it's grown up so much now, you can't really see. It's been 15 years since the encounter, and I guess nobody else has been out here, and there's so many new trees. This area is known for uh, barrel encounters. And we'll try to go down in that area. It's actually something walking. There's definitely something right, right through this area. In the woods, and I don't know what it is. Now, guys, if I say run, y'all run. In Daniel Boone National Forest, Kentucky. There's actually something walking. Ron Coffey and Jason Caldwell are searching for the infamous Barilla. Well, you know, when you stand here, it kind of looks like Yeah, a it's a trail. Yeah. But something's definitely used this for a trail. So it's broke off branches all the way through here. The smallest hint could lead them to the monster. I always look up in a the tree. They've been known to climb. But you can see where something's actually chipped the bark out here. Usually with Barillo, you'll have more like a claw mark. Let's try this way. There's another tree, good. Possibility right here, some claw, claw marks. This looks more like what we associate with the Barilla. Long claw, you can see it's out this way. Mm -hmm. I think there's something a few feet in front of us. Yeah. We've been hearing something right ahead of us here since we started. It's not leaving. The most wild game would have done ran off, but something is definitely staying. I'd say it's probably not much farther on the other side of that brush. Just, just enough to stay out of sight. But according to biologist John Cox, Ron and Jason's search in the woods may be futile. So I'm an assistant professor of wildlife ecology and conservation biology at the University of Kentucky. Kentucky has been explored by Europeans since the mid-1700s. When the explorers came in, there were bears everywhere. They slaughtered bears uh, pretty prolifically, but within a few decades, those species were wiped out of this area. At the turn of the century, when humans in the U.S. recognized that, look, we're wiping out a number of species, we decided to pass game laws and try to protect what biodiversity, what game species that we had left. Then we had sort of a slow repopulation growth of these bears from these very remote what we might call refugia up in the highlands of Appalachia. Really it wasn't until the 70s where they started trickling it in in any great numbers. And it's estimated we probably have somewhere between three and 500 bears in the state. My best guess for what people have seen in the woods would be that it could be a young black bear. It's very common that if you do see a bear, it's foraging around trees or something that it could easily reach up to pull a beehive out of a tree. And when a bear raises up on two hind legs, you know, it looks very humanoid. Its hands are sort of long. But a lot of times people don't get that second glance or they're not experienced enough to look where the details are. 
and sometimes you know your eyes play tricks on you. The first modern testimony of Barilla's existence coincides exactly with the return of black bears to Kentucky. I know the Barilla's here. You know, it's just a matter of finding the proof that he's here. But Ron and Jason are convinced that the monster they saw is no mere bear. He could be on the other side of the bush right now. We couldn't see it. It's just the vegetation is so thick. And so much of Kentucky is like what we're standing in now. So it would be very easy for a barilla to hide in this, this type of wilderness. If you notice, there's a lot of, a lot of brush that's broken off right here. So something has actually cleared a trail through here. This has been a larger creature come through. That might be a useful track, but it's not very well defined. I'm going to try to cast it. Like so this track isn't very deep at all. I've got doubts if it's going to make anything, but we'll try. We've probably gone, probably gone a half a mile or better back into the woods. If something is staying just a few feet out of our sight, always in front of us. Whatever this is, is watching us. It's out there. Dead end. The plaster cast reveals nothing. Are we ready to head back? Yeah. Okay. I don't think we can go any deeper anyway. But their belief in the monster is such that they intend to continue their research and prove Barilla's existence once and for all. I'd say all senses are very enhanced. It's vision, it's uh, hearing, sense of smell to be able to survive as long as it has without being detected. The whole time we were there, there was something moving. As we moved, it moved. I am convinced it was there, you know. Just like we seen down there, three foot from you, you couldn't see anything, you know. We kept hearing something down there and everything else would have ran off. So while we were looking for it, it was watching us. I know he was out there. Even though he didn't see Barilla on his quest through the forest with Ron, Jason Caldwell remains adamant. It was definitely the monster that he came across that fateful night in 1999. We kept hearing something in front of us. It never got that far away. It wasn't a deer. We don't know what it was. You know, if it was down there beside us, you, you would never see it. Um, yeah, I mean, something was with us, you know. Um, but I just don't believe it was something other than an animal, you know. It's, I think it's crazy. <laughs> I'll make him a believer one day. Sometimes I think he's full of crap. I love him, though. He's my brother. John Cox would like to believe, but. As far as I know, we have no physical evidence in terms of carcasses, in terms of reliable tracks of any kind of cryptid species in Kentucky. But Ron Coffey believes he has the ultimate proof, strong enough to sway even science-minded skeptics. I found several tracks in the mud, but this is about the only one I could really get a good casting of. It's just unique because very few tracks have ever been found of these creatures. But tracks can be very deceptive because the way they look depends on the substrate that you find them in. If you find them in mud, then it's likely that that animal is going to hit that mud and it's going to slide, just like a person would when they step with a boot. And that track's going to be distorted. So you would say it's got a human-like heel. It has like canine pads on the bottom of its foot. You can also see what appears to be a line of claws, perhaps. That's why I think it's possibly the Barilla. It, it just matches the description of the foot. It's very easy to be fooled as to what kind of tracks you're looking for. And it takes real, literally decades to become an expert tracker because of those different factors that may contribute to altering what a track looks like. But, you know, in science, the, the absence of evidence is not necessarily evidence of absence. You can never say something is not there because, you know, we don't have evidence for it. Well, there's all different theories. Some theory is it's just a, a un, undiscovered canine. Kangaroo was once a cryptid. Platypus was once a cryptid. We know now what they are, but they were a legend at one point. And I'm sure that the Barilla, one day, 
will be known, but right now we don't know what they are. Particularly small creatures have not been identified. But at this point we're largely talking about things like plants, insects, but we've pretty much known about all the mammals, the big mammals, for at least about 100 years. There are archaeological sites where we find bones of animals that were here long before Europeans came in. We're, we're just not seeing any evidence that there's any kind of cryptid species uh, that we know about. Another theory that's actually, this creature may be a creature that, that we once thought was extinct that is now actually not extinct. It's known as the Ampicillon or, or bear dog. Now scientists have always agreed that it was here at least 100,000 years ago, but scientists have always disagreed as to when it became extinct. The early ancestor of, of the dog and the bear family would be something that sort of looks like a blend between these two creatures. It would be much more rounded, maybe not have so much of a, a long rostrum or snout and be a little bit bigger body. So it kind of looks like a hybrid between those two species. The legs are short and stout and the hips are wide so we know it could have walked on two legs easily. And its front legs are much longer than the back so when it stood up it would have had arms. The feet and the hands look very humanoid. The accounts also explain that this animal walks upright which doesn't really mesh with the way these animals move through the landscape, particularly the way wolves hunt. They're cursorial hunters, so they're runners. And so four-leg locomotion is much more efficient when it comes to catching prey, particularly if you're a carnivore, than it is to be trying to run around on two legs and catch something. You know, people imagine bears walking around in these circus settings where they're walking and doing this kind of thing, but that's very unnatural for a bear to be able to do that for more than a few steps. If it really doesn't make sense for either a bear or a wolf to, to be able to walk around on two legs. The interesting thing is the areas that are still experiencing these sightings, we find remains of this, this bear dog. So that's why I think it has, I think they're related. Uh, millions of years ago, bears and dogs have a common ancestor. But those two branches, the canids, the dog family, and the bears, the ursids, have branched off long ago. For a hybridization to occur would be practically impossible. Wolves have 78 chromosomes, bear, black bears have 74 of them. So genetically, they don't match up enough in a way that you're gonna be able to hybridize those two species and, and produce some kind of you know, hybrid creature of a bearilla. We find these remains, and that's exactly the same places that this barilla type creature is also spotted. So I don't think it's a coincidence myself. I think, I think that's what it is, the bear dog. If the barilla belongs more to storytelling than reality, how can we explain the gruesome deaths of cattle in the region over the years? More recently, in uh, Wadi, they had a rash of mysterious livestock killings. And they were not eaten, they were just slaughtered. So that, that's really where the, the strangeness comes into the situation because you figure if it was like a wolf or something, they would be hunting for, hunting for prey and more to like sustain, but it was just more like for fun. So that, that was really the strange part of the whole situation. There's a number of carnivores in the world that do what we call surplus killing, but here in the U.S., particularly with regards to domestic livestock, when you see something like that, that is typically dogs. Stray dogs are notorious for killing things and leaving them. So if we're talking about attacking cattle, wolves, and, and a lot of times with stray dogs, the first thing that they'll grab is the face. And they'll pull that face and they'll rip the face apart because something like a cow, they're really trying to find some kind of appendage to, to bite. Wolves don't really, other than the legs, they really don't have anything to kind of grab onto. They sent off DNA testing out of one of the animals that have been um, badly maimed, and it came back as a result of canine, but some of the people still really weren't satisfied with that. The biggest animal we have in this area that could have done something like that that we know of would be a bear, and the black bear we have here are not that big, and of course a coyote or wolf could not have done it, period, nor could feral dogs have done it. That's what's really mysterious about it. Still, 
to this day, it really hasn't been confirmed, um, but most people think it must have been a dog, uh, but there's, there's no confirmation as far as that goes. Monster or myth, the legend of Berilla lives on in a state where people are crazy about all things paranormal. Mount Sterling is one of the most haunted towns uh, in Kentucky and possibly eastern United States. Just because of all the past, we had several Civil War skirmishes here as well as Revolutionary War skirmishes. The town itself used to be full of shoot 'em up saloons and brothels and a lot of murders. Uh, that was a lot of energy that was left behind. Um, some people have had experiences in the downtown area, especially uh, the most historical part of town. People have reported seeing like apparitions, possible ghosts in windows, cold spots that they can feel whenever you walk into a certain area where something has happened in the past. We even had a marshal who was gunned down at, at the town square. As you cross Main Street, people feel a cold spot in the middle of the road right where he was gunned down that we've got a, a tourist business around here for, uh, for cryptids and, and Bigfoot, Barilla. Uh, there have been people who have come into the Daniel Boone National Forest for the very purpose of, of hunting for those cryptid creatures. The reason being this, it's the uh, diverse topography here. You go into the east, you've got mountains. Go through the central part in the bluegrass, you've got growing hills and grassland. You go into the west, you've got swamp. There's more running water in Kentucky than in any state except Alaska. There's plenty of food. It's no problem to walk into the barnyard and swoop up a pig or something if you wanted to, you know? So it's, it's a good food supply as well. More open territory than it is urban, so there's plenty of room for it to roam in. Shelter, food, and water, so that in itself would make it a great habitat for any number of creatures. But as to the actual existence of Berilla, opinions are divided. It's hard for me to believe in, in the Berilla in this area. I'd have to see some sort of definitive proof. Of course, the best evidence for any of these cryptids would be actually managing to recover one. I'd like to say yes, that I would probably believe in the Barilla. I'd like to think that there is probably things in the, in the forest that we don't know about. Uh, unfortunately, I don't see enough evidence to suggest that Barilla exists. I, 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 don't, I would have to see physical evidence, uh, you know, to make me actually believe in Barilla. And sadly, some people can never be persuaded if you rode one in on a, with a saddle, why don't they wouldn't believe it? That's just the way it is. Some people just don't believe stuff. But. There is one a school of thought that all the cryptids, such as the Barilla or a Bigfoot, could actually be ghosts of animals that, were, that once walked the earth. So, you know, there, there's a possibility that, that it could be a ghost of a bear dog. You know, God bless America. We're entitled to believe anything we want to. <laughs> I mean, I, I tell people a story all the time, and they, and they tell me, you know, I'm crazy. We all know, based on court testimonies, that our memories are not that good. I know what I saw. I pack cameras now. I want to have proof, you know, so I can, I can convince people. I'd be always receptive to see physical evidence, but right now, you know, to me at least, it only exists in, in myth and lore. I definitely think the idea of the Barilla existing is a cool idea. Something out there that exists that we don't know much about. It's just the mystery in it is really what draws me in, I think. If such a creature does exist, maybe it's better just to leave them alone and let them sort of go about their own way and live out their own existence. For Ron Coffey, the explanation is simple. I really don't believe there is such a thing as a monster. Uh, I think that all monster legends are, are based on flesh and blood animals. Animals that we just haven't been able to identify and put a name on yet. In New Jersey, there lurks a strange monster that terrorizes anyone who ventures deep enough into the forests of the Pine Barrens. I've driven through the pines a few times. But not with the top down. <laughs> no way. Anything can get you. Beware of the Jersey Devil. God almighty, did you, is that, was that running? Something just ran across the road.
To most people, New Jersey is Atlantic City casinos, the beaches of Cape May, lush national parks, and the backdrop for the legendary television series, The Sopranos. But this beautiful state and its rich history hide a secret, one that terrorizes some and amuses others, the Jersey Devil. Jerry Plameri is among those who fear the Jersey Devil. It was like 1964, and everybody went down the shore. Everyone, everybody went to Seaside. And um, we were on our way home from the shore, going through the pines, and we had a convertible with the top down. And all of a sudden, I heard this blood-curdling scream. This isn't normal. This wasn't human. I looked over in the trees, and there was these lights, like two red lights like this. And it seemed to be something like swinging from tree to tree. I guess maybe about two minutes later, all of a sudden this thing flies in front of us. It was like six feet in front of us. And thank God, because we would have hit it. If he'd have came closer, we would, we would have ran right into him. But he, and he just stood there looking at us. I mean, we just, we sat like this. He stared at us looking mean. And I'm thinking, he's gonna, he's gonna kill us. And we couldn't move. We couldn't even back the car up. We were too scared to do anything. We just, three of us just stared at each other. It was weird. It was really weird. Most people laugh or give me a look like, yeah, right. And three of my girlfriends in Iceland, I told about it. And they all just looked at me. One said, oh, I've heard about it. But, and I says, no, it's real. She didn't believe me. Mm -hmm. Honestly, I don't care if you don't believe me. I believe my mother. Leeds Point in Galloway County is considered the birthplace of the Jersey Devil. It's here that the legend of the monster is taken most seriously, and the mayor, Don Purdy, is particularly proud of their most famous resident. I own a, a towing company with six tow trucks, and I own a body shop, and I own an auto repair center, and then I am the mayor of the town. I don't think that we've ever put a number on the amount of people that travel to Galloway Township or Leeds Point to find the, uh, or search of the Jersey Devil. But I'm sure there's a lot that we don't know. You know from going around the state of New Jersey at different stories that you've heard, but it all comes back to here. You know, it all this is it, Galloway Township is the home of the Jersey Devil. Well, Galloway's pretty unique. Galloway Township is uh, the largest municipality in the state of New Jersey, depends on who's measuring it. Uh, it's uh, 114 square miles. Uh, a lot of people measure some of the wetlands and so forth. Um, it's a large community. It's really close to um, Atlantic City. Ken Suey is one of our great historians of uh, Galloway Township. And Ken is a great guy in knowing the history of um, not only Galloway Township, but Leeds Point, because that's where Ken lives. Um, and, and I think that uh, there's history there, and I think as long as there's history, it will live. I believe that. Uh, you are in uh, Galloway Township uh, Historical Society Library. We collect uh, anything and everything to do with primarily Galloway Township, but we also have an Atlantic City room, and anything in the area of historical value we assemble and uh, record, keep records on it, and keep it for posterity. This small village of a few hundred souls was named after its founder, Daniel Leeds, a name as famous as it is common among locals. There is but one Leeds family that were established in South Jersey. There was uh, some other ones in New England, but the Leeds family that established in New Jersey went ahead, proceeded. The first mayor of Atlantic City was uh, Leeds. Ch Chalky Leeds. Chalky Leeds. Yeah. Mayor of uh, Galloway Township has been a Leeds at one point in time. Yeah, Harry. Yeah, Harry Leeds. Harry Leeds, and I'm married to a Leeds. <laughs> But the most famous of the Leeds is Jean, or as she's known here, Mother Leeds. This mother of 13 children influenced New Jersey for centuries, beginning in 1735. 
It seems that Jane Leaves and her husband Daniel lived in a cabin at the edge of a great swamp along the Mullica River. Now, folks in these parts say that it was a strange family, an unusual family. Some people even said that Jane Leeds was a witch. One night, she learned that she was pregnant with her 13th child. And in a moment of understandable weakness, she said, as she was saying her prayers, Lord, let this one not be a child. Let this one be a devil. He was about eight feet tall and the, like the head of a horse. And he looked angry and he had horns. And long, his long arms had claws on the ends of it. You know, like it could really scratch you. The body was like all decrepit, sort of like body of a horse, but, but not beautiful and smooth like a horse would be. And then like when, you know when a horse is up on, on two legs and they're, they're, they're going with their paws like this? The legs in the back are all crooked. Well, this is what he, do, he was. And he was walking on them like that with hooves. And I'm telling you, I thought I was crazy. I didn't think I really saw this. And um, no sooner did he just stare at us like that for about two minutes. But two minutes is long when you're scared. Um, he just sprouted his wings like this, which were humongous. They were really big and just took off into the forest. Thank you for not killing me, seriously because I could have been dead. People who claim to have seen the Jersey Devil describe it as having a dog or horse's head, horns, a body like a kangaroo's, broad wings, a reptile's tail, hooves, and razor-sharp claws. Someday in the late fall, listen carefully when you hear the wind coming off the ocean through the pines. It almost seems like someone is trying to tell us something, possibly someone's name. Oh, Mother Leeds. Oh, Mother Leeds. But how does a woman from America's colonial era give birth to the devil? Well, we do know that it was an unusual family. It was a very large family. It had 12 children. And Jane Leeds, her problem was not really with her husband. Daniel, he was a good hunter, an excellent fisherman, a decent gardener. There was always food on the table. That wasn't the problem. The problem was that Daniel Leeds didn't take very much interest in the children. And so Jane Leeds was left with the cleaning, the cooking, the laundry, chopping wood, picking things up, putting things away. To tell the truth, she was at her wit's end. She was frustrated. On that frightful night in February of 1735, when Mother Leeds' 13th child was born, it started out a perfectly healthy, normal little baby boy with blonde hair and blue eyes. But then something went terribly wrong. My name is Rochelle Christopher. I am an independent historian with Victorian Vanities. My organization teaches people about American history. And one of the things we look at generally in the show that I do on Weird New Jersey is the New Jersey Devil. And I did see it once. I'd been driving for a couple of hours. I was between Cape May and Stone Harbor and it jumped out in the road. And of course it then flew away. Mother Leeds gave birth. The devil apparently was a beautiful baby boy. Soon after he was born, he grew talons and horns and wings unfurled from his back and very long legs. He went into the next room where the midwives were and his father killed his father and mother, killed other children cowering in the corner, um, killed his mother and then flew up the chimney leaving all of this rubble behind. The tranquility of Leeds Point residents is sometimes disturbed by curious travelers looking for the very source of the Jersey Devil legend. The first stop on their macabre pilgrimage? A house built on the ruins of the legendary residence of Jane Leeds. There are cults who believe in the New Jersey Devil, and some people believe 
this is the neighborhood, this is the house. They're going to threaten, they're gonna, they want what they want, which is to burn down the house if they can't take pictures, to do seances, to conjure it up, but they're looking for a connection to the devil, which this lady who owns the house claims is not real. There is nearby a cemetery. It's called Leeds Point Community Cemetery. And it has maybe about 40 or 50 stones in it. And there were kids from Stockton, students from Stockton University, and they did a seance up there, hoping to conjure up something. History and folklore mingle in the legendary stories of the Jersey Devil. One of the most famous of them features none other than Napoleon's brother, Joseph Bonaparte. There's a wonderful story about Joseph Bonaparte, the, um, the older brother of Napoleon, who lived in Philadelphia while he was waiting for his house to be built in Mount Holly. And um, he had an encounter with the New Jersey Devil. And apparently he looked at it with his gun and the New Jersey Devil looked at him and they both looked at each other and finally the Devil flew away. Well, Joseph Bonaparte swore that he was going to find the Devil and bring it home as a trophy. Of course, he never saw it again. But it was in 1909, during the week of January 16th to 22nd, that the Jersey Devil made its most famous appearance, throwing the entire country into panic. Monster sightings occurred in Atlantic City, Philadelphia, and outside New York City. The newspapers picked up the story, and the Philadelphia Zoo even offered $10,000 for his capture. 1909, the week when everybody said they saw it. That was the week when the New Jersey Devil was seen all over southern New Jersey, but it flew away. It was seen in Bridgeton, and it flew away. It was seen by a group of, of people on a trolley car, in Camden and it flew away. And that seems to be the story. They saw it and it flew away. And everyone on the trolley car said they saw it. It made an appearance on a rooftop. Adults in Philadelphia and Camden were afraid to send their children to school because they were afraid the New Jersey Devil was going to make its appearance. Paul Evans Peterson Jr. is one of those who believes in the legend of the Jersey Devil. He devotes his free time to organizing monster hunts and writing songs about New Jersey and its history. He even wrote a book, The Legendary Pine Barrens, New Tales from Old Haunts. Hey, my name is Paul Evans Pedersen, Jr. I am a singer, songwriter, author, and jewelry maker. And I live here in the Pine Barrens of South Jersey. And I've seen the Jersey Devil. When Jerry Plumeri saw an ad in the local newspaper announcing a conference hosted by Paul Evans Peterson, she jumped at the opportunity to share her terrifying encounter in the summer of 64. I kind of like put it in the, in the back of my mind because everybody thought I was nuts. So I ignored it. And it now mind you, years and years are gone by. This was 1964. When I saw in the newspaper, uh, they're having this, this talk at the, at the library Paul Peterson is going to, um, he writes books about the Jersey Devil. And I said, you know what, I gotta go see this. I really, there's something telling me to go. And I sat there in the second row, because I knew I was gonna talk to him. And I'm in the second row and he's talking. I was mesmerized by his talking because he, was, he saw the Jersey Devil five times. And, I, and he said, has anybody seen the Jersey Devil? So I got, I went like this real meek because I'm thinking, these people are going to think I'm nuts. But they, you could hear a pin drop in the room. You made this your life thing. Basically. Yeah. Yeah. I never saw his face. I saw it hopping away from me. Ooh. And I heard it coming up my cellar steps and banging on the door. But never came face to face? Never came face to face with it. Nope. I'll write a book called I Shook Hands with the Jersey Devil. That'd be great. I'd love that. 
Me too. I shook claws with a Jersey Devil. <laughs> <laughs> If the Jersey Devil was born in Leeds Point, he hides in the forests of Pine Barrens. Today, Jerry Plumeri and Paul Evans Peterson meet at the visitor center of the Pine Barrens Preservation Alliance, on the edge of the forest where the monster last appeared. Does it, he, no, do you want me to tell the truth? He doesn't look anything like what I saw. What I saw was about this tall, but these are like real hands. He didn't have real hands, they were claws. And the legs didn't know nothing like this. It was like a horse when it was standing up on, on, on its hind legs, where the, the back legs are bent, and he had hooves, which he has hooves, and a long tail. But um, a head of a horse, but this, this looks too gentle. He didn't look gentle, he had red lights for his eyes and horns. So a lot of people down through the years have seen it and, uh, and, and have shot at it. I have a friend of mine that shot at it three times. See, you don't, you don't hear about it for a long, long time. Right. Well, they say that any time you see a lot, of, a lot of sightings of the Jersey Devil, yeah. it means a war is coming. One of the best ways to protect yourself from the Jersey Devil is you got to find these tracks. And this is a story that goes back to me and my grandkids, or my kids when my kids were little. And I would tell them, you got to get a little shovel and dig the track real carefully and put it into a glass jar and screw the lid on it and keep that jar under your bed. <laughs> and as long as you keep that track in the jar under your bed, the Jersey Devil will never hurt you. Wow. They all think we're all nuts in Jersey Devil. Yeah, no, seriously, they do. Between the Jersey Devil and all the people in the malls, we are crazy. Right, really, when you come down to it, the Jersey Devil. Now, where do you hear that? Any, any other state? Yeah. All the stories that have ever been told about the Jersey Devil are born right there. Yep. That's it. That's where it all comes from. The Pine Barrens is 4,500 square kilometers or 1,700 square miles of dense forest bordering the Atlantic coast south of the state of New Jersey. In 1978, it became the first nature reserve protected by the U.S. government. People come here to get lost in nature. Some come to chase monsters. It is said that come nightfall, campers often find themselves more than a little unnerved. All right, what we're going to do right now is we're going to go through the... Uh like the heart of the Pine Barrens. And we're going to be looking for uh, Jersey Devil tracks. And uh, if we can, you know, we never know, we might see something. Uh, the correct behavior is just to pay a close attention to what's going on in the woods, uh, not disturbing anything, because there's like 30 different kinds of plants that grow there and nowhere else that are on the endangered uh, species lists. Uh, there's a lot of animals on the same list, endangered species. And we're just going to watch the woods and see what comes out of it. And if we see the Jersey Devil, this has a really good reverse gear. And we'll be putting it in reverse and getting away from it. Welcome to New Jersey. <laughs> when I go hunting for the Jersey Devil, I like to go either right in this area, back along the Mullica River, or down in Cumberland County, which is closer to the Delaware Bay than it is to the Atlantic Ocean. That's number one, that's why I keep a compass in the car. But as long as I know where the sun is, I'm usually pretty good about not getting lost. But I've been back here before, and it, it gets very frustrating if you don't know where you are. And you can get yourself really lost back here. And I mean for a whole day. Maybe, and if it gets dark, forget about it. If you don't know what the hell phase the moon's in, <laughs> you're gonna stay out there. I love it out here. This place is my heart, man, it really is. And ever since, ever since I've been a little kid, I just keep coming back out here and I've 
you know, tried to learn everything I can about all the different species of plants and animals and, and about the people. It's just, it's just a really special place. The earth in the Pine Barrens is sandy, which caused many European settlers to leave the area in search of more fertile land. Since then, this vast territory, which occupies nearly a quarter of the state of New Jersey, has been considered an inhospitable land. But this is a mistake, according to historian Kenneth Suey. This would have been a paradise for people that were establishing uh, housing first coming down. I have fuel, I have fire, I have water, I have fish in the water, I have food. I have cranberries that can grow here. They, they had the necessities of life. I, I don't consider us barren at all. Uh, just look around you. Do you see anything barren about, about where we're at? I mean, water lilies, uh, holly, magnolias, we have it all. Yeah, we're only going to go a little further. It is here that the Jersey Devil has made his home. The monster has been known to take long drinks from the deserted swamps of the Pine Barrens. Another favorite haunt of the Jersey Devil, the ghost town of Batstow. This uninhabited village dates from 1766, almost 30 years after the birth of the monster. The Jersey Devil was, has been seen here through the years. Um, this village was started in the 1700s, and it was started as a uh, ironworks. And they made stuff, iron stuff, for the colonists. And during the Revolutionary War, they made munitions and stuff for the, uh, for the Revolutionary War fighters. And uh, after that, in the 1800s, it was turned into a glass works. And they made window glass, what they call window light. And uh, the state of New Jersey has preserved it. And it looks pretty much like it did uh, back in that time. Over the years, the Jersey Devil's been seen here several times, re reported seen here several times by, you know, residents, workers. And this is the area where the sightings are very prevalent. It's right around here, because we're not that far from the Back Bays. The Batstow River's right through here. Uh, Batstow Lake is right over there. And it seems that the Jersey Devil prefers areas where there's water. So in areas like this, this is, you know, where you're going to see it. Yeah, he's quiet until he starts screaming at people. And that's, that's mainly what you hear about, is people hear it. They hear this ungodly scream that they can't, you know, put their finger on what kind of animal they've ever heard in their life made that scream. And a lot of your quote-unquote sightings are actually hearings, you know, people that have heard whatever this thing is. And uh, now we're going to go back into uh, Bulltown Road, which is another kind of like a village back here where it's been seen a lot. So. If you fish where there ain't no fish, you ain't going to catch them. If you go looking for the Jersey Devil where he ain't going to be that day, you ain't going to see it. <laughs> How did the Pine Barrens become synonymous with fear and danger in the minds of the residents of New Jersey? Over the centuries, some people have had a personal interest in cultivating the mystery of the forest. The Pine Barrens, because it's so uh, sparsely populated, um, is a good place if you want to uh, carry on illegal activities, because who's going to see you? Uh, so, for example, in the early days of the Republic, um, Alexander Hamilton had the idea to collect duties at the ports. So ships coming from Europe might go to New York or Philadelphia, and when they pull in, the tax collector was there to collect the customs duty. But let's say you don't want to pay the taxes. Well, maybe you could take your ship to Barnegat Bay or to Tuckerton and come ashore with the goods loaded onto Conestoga wagons, 
which could take the goods to New York and Philadelphia, you would increase your profits because you didn't have to pay the taxes. Now, naturally, you don't want revenue officers coming around. And so you tell people the story of the Jersey Devil. You know, when outsiders come around into the woods, they often don't come out. And it was a, it was a mode of intimidation. Small, sandy roads crisscross the Pine Barrens. In New Jersey, they are called sugar sand roads. And of course, to venture on them increases your chance of coming face to face with the Jersey Devil. Did you, is that, was that running? Oh, oh man, something just ran across the road. This is, this is where, if you're gonna see something, this is where you're gonna see it. The Jersey Devil has been seen, or reported, reportedly seen, and this is one of the main roads that they have the Jersey Devil hunts on. Because this is pretty much in the middle of the Pine Barrens right here. This is smack dab in the middle of it. driven through the pines a few times, but not with the top down. <laughs> no way. No. <sighs> Anything can get you. Anything can drop out from the trees. Even today, many people, sane, trustworthy people, say they believe in the existence of the Jersey Devil. There have been over 2,000 reported sightings, but what did these people really see? A lot of people have said they've seen it. Could be anything. Could be drunk, could be tired, could be they want attention, could be they saw something. I can tell you that I don't believe in it, but when I drive through the Pine Barrens at night, there is something, it is creepy, and I don't know what it is. There are um, explanations, uh, and uh, many times um, my colleagues, fellow scholars, have come up with hypotheses to explain away uh, what people uh, s saw, but they think they saw the Jersey Devil, but it was really something else. One is um, like the fruit bat, because bat-like wings, okay, we're, we're halfway there, and it's night, and it's in the woods, and you're not familiar with wildlife, and you're scared, and you, you know the story already. Well. The Jersey Devil pops into your mind as an explanation for what you saw. So that would be one possibility. Um, far more uh, plausible is the Great Horned Owl. The, the Great Horned Owl has quite a wingspan and makes clicking noises. And coming at you at night in the woods could be frightening enough. And again, if you already know the story of the Jersey Devil, you might mistake the Great Horned Owl for the Jersey Devil. I have uh, fished, uh, trapped, and uh, hunted for most of my life. I've been out in the bays, in the woods, in the swamps, at every hour of the day and night. I've heard some really strange noises, which I have to attribute to being animal noises of one type or another. Uh, but I do not believe that there's a Jersey Devil. I believe it is a legend. It's really kind of a lousy feeling when you're trying to tell somebody something and they're laughing at you. It's supernatural. And people, a lot of people are interested in that. I know I am. I mean, I watch some crazy shows, you know, Thriller and all that. I watch some crazy shows, but this wasn't, this wasn't a show. This was true. So. I don't see how they can't believe when there's people like me, and I know there's other people that's seen them. 
And I'm telling you, word for word, and I never changed my story when I told it to Paul. I've never swayed from the story. It's a truth. I'm not making it up. But like, a, like I said, a couple of my friends think I'm off, off my rocker. They think I'm making it up for attention. No way. The last stop on the trail of the Jersey Devil, the Washington Tavern, the only remnant of a village long gone. This is as far as we'll go. The ruins are right over there. This is the site of the Washington Tavern. And this is one of the best places, if you listen real close, you will see how absolutely dead quiet it is. You can see how old this, this growth in here is. This has been here a long, long time. And it's amazing, any time of year you come here, it's always this quiet. It's like everything else is afraid to live around here. And that's, that's part of the legend that uh, at the birthplace of the Jersey Devil, no animal, birds, anything. It's very strange. Very strange. Gives you a chill every time you come down here, and I've been coming down here for a long while. There's basically <clears throat> a clearing over here The Jersey Devil has been sighted a lot here. And it was one of the hangouts of Joe Moliner, one of the pine robbers. And like I said, this is all that's left. But this was a tavern uh, built out here in the middle of nowhere now. But back in the day, this was quite the place to be. And now it's just a ghost town. In the time when these ruins were a village, legends about monsters had significant resonance in the community. Ever since the 20th century, um, there have been forces working against these traditional stories. I mean, in, in my romantic imagination, I can see, say, in the 19th century, uh, the village storyteller uh, sitting around the potbelly stove in the general store, regaling people with stories and people with fiddles and banjos having a Saturday night dance. In the old days, people made their own entertainment. They made their own music, they told their own stories. Our culture doesn't really support leisurely storytelling anymore. And that's kind of like the the foundation and the floor was what it went across. And that was the, that was the basement of it. This all used to be brick and it's disappearing. So even just, even just standing here, you gotta wonder. It really feels like you're being watched. The story of the Jersey Devil has been passed down for three centuries, and along the way, it has undergone some changes. The commercialization of the Jersey Devil was inevitable, but it had some positive and some negative consequences, according to folklorist Angus Gillespie. The traditional stories of the Jersey Devil, and I think this is something that's very hard for contemporary audiences to understand, in the original versions, in the, among the old families of South Jersey, this is an awesome, fearsome, nasty, dangerous creature 
who's said to have slit the throats of babies in their cribs. Uh, this is a creature that's monstrous and evil. Since we have, for the last several years, this hockey team called the New Jersey Devils, there's a lot of name recognition. I mean, people almost worldwide, uh, certainly in North America, uh, recognize the name, but they don't really know the story. Uh, and the other problem is, over time, and particularly in places like Smithville, which is very close to Leeds Point, you have like souvenir shops selling uh, T-shirts, uh, shot glasses, uh, pennants, uh, postcards, and, and the usual representation is of the uh, Jersey Devil as a kind of a cartoon character who's kind of cute. Uh, and um, from my point of view, I mean, that's, that's all wrong. I mean, this is not clever or cute or cartoon-like. This is awesome and scary and frightful. Once feared, today the Jersey Devil is celebrated. Even New Jersey native Bruce Springsteen has sung about the devil. Everyone embraces the maiden New Jersey legend, and everyone has their story to tell. And I was a kid riding a bike down there one time. My dogs were with me, the dirt road back there at King's Highway. Something came out of the woods, made a noise. My dogs, like, chased it through the woods. They were barking and all this stuff. I don't know, I don't, I don't know what it was this day. But I've hunted all around here all my life. And you just hear all the Jersey Devil stories, and then I'd be in the woods, you'd hear some screaming, people said, ah, it's just a fox. But I don't know what it was. I'm 49, and I've been told this stuff all my, since I was little. Who knows if it's true? I mean, I, I sort of believe it, it's like Bigfoot. I believe in Bigfoot. As a kid, I saw it as real. As a kid, I certainly saw it as real, especially going to, you go to the local library and they have all the, uh, the old Jersey Devil documentaries, like, you know, oh, we saw something rustling in the woods, you know. It's, <laughs> yeah, I, I loved it, I, I loved it. You know, just having that, that bit of imagination to what might be lurking in the woods, and there's, there's plenty of woods for it to lurk in, too. I talk about it all the time. I talk about it anybody that'll listen, pretty much, <laughs> so. Well, I have plenty of relatives that, that have claimed that they've heard mostly heard the Jersey Devil, something rustling in the bushes. I think it's usually probably just a deer screaming, but I like to believe them when they say they heard it. But even those who believe in the monster don't necessarily think it's dangerous or means to harm anyone. I just think he's scared and I think he's lost yeah. and doesn't know where he belongs. Sure. And maybe he's he just wants to reach out, but everybody's so scared of him because he looks like what people would call a freak, not to be mean, but he, he doesn't look normal and people get scared of that. And he's become the devil. If he was the devil, he would have killed people. Yeah. He would have attacked people. So he's, I wouldn't, I think devil's the wrong word for him. I think he's just one of our many wonderful people to add to Jersey. I asked Paul how in the world this thing is still alive if it was born in the 1700s. Because let's face it, come on, that's a long time ago. And he says it reinvents itself. The first thing I said, well, who does he mate with? I mean, there's no other monsters. Who does he mate with? But the thing is, it's there. It's really there. But he doesn't hurt anybody. That's, that's the main thing. I think that, that's pretty cool. He's, he's, he's sort of like in limbo. He's, he's ro roaming around and has no place to go. As a professional folklorist, it's my job to be a professional agnostic. Uh, I don't want to be too skeptical, and I don't want to be too gullible. Uh, besides, when I'm interviewing people, I have to show respect. And um, if somebody believes in the Jersey Devil, I'm not going to disabuse them of that. Uh, I want to draw them out. Um, and I think um, it's easy enough to find skeptics. It's harder to find true believers, and it's harder yet to find a true believer who will go public with her story. Uh, 
Uh, we didn't see him, and it's, it's, you know, there's been a lot of people down through the years that go on Jersey Devil hunts, and with all kinds of equipment, with all kinds of detectors and electronic stuff and this, that, and the other thing, and that's not usually when it happens. You know, hopefully we could have had it happen, but uh, it didn't. Of course, the day's not over yet. You never know. It's a long ride back to Hamilton. But um, usually it's, it's somebody down here fishing or hunting or just going for a walk, and the thing will come out and stand in front of them or, or you know, jump in front of its car, and that's, that's, when, you, that's when it's seen. It's at, it's at the strangest times or the most unexpected times. And, and any time you come to this part of South Jersey, could be the time you see it. And every time I come down here fishing or just taking a ride with a wife and taking some pictures, that could be the time that you look right into its eyes and it's Jersey Devil. In the backwater marshes where the cranberries grow, the water takes on the color wine as it flows and every evening the sun's fire drowns in the bay and all the creatures that live here they have their own special way and I swear it's true these pine barren blue the folks that live in the barren have a story they tell They say the old leads woman She bore a child from hell The night he's born he took wings on And flew out into the night They say you still hear him screaming When the conditions are right And I swear it's true these pine barren blue. Every time I go down there, I may not say anything to anybody else, but in my head, I'm thinking. I'm You're looking, looking in the trees. I'm looking in the trees. I'm, uh, you know, even when I'm driving, I'm looking just to make sure because you, you just never know. You don't know. I think it has to do with the weirdness that is New Jersey. If you're at all interested in the weird, New Jersey is probably the home of the weird. The next time you go into the woods late at night, take care. And when you hear the sudden crack of a twig behind you, beware. Beware of the Jersey Devil. In the plains of Texas, Whoa. a disgusting creature terrorizes ranchers. It's a creature unlike they've ever seen before. They are pretty gruesome looking. They're really scary. Night after night, the same scene, animals drained of their blood. The chicken was opened only in its thorax area. All told, I lost 28. The perpetrator, the chupacabra. Be sure we have a full clip. Let's go. Texas, an oil-rich state in the southern United States, marked by vast plains and stunning scenery. Here, the cowboys are not mere movie characters. Cattle breeding is a big part of life in the countryside. For 30 years, ranchers have anxiously awaited the comings and goings of a mysterious creature with protruding fangs, the chupacabra. It was in the village of Ratcliffe that the monster was last seen. Would you go turn the chili off? Jackie and Arnold Stoke were among the most recent witnesses. My husband has a habit. If he wakes up during the night, 
He will come to the patio door and shine a flashlight out in the yard to see if any animal out. He just enjoys that. And I like to look at the deer and the feral hogs, and I like to shoot feral hogs. That's one of my things I really like to do. <laughs> one night, well, it was a Friday night. He woke me up. It was after midnight. And that thing was sitting up in there eating corn. And I called Jackie, and I said, Jackie, I said, come here and look at this thing. I ain't never seen nothing like it. And he was sitting on the squirrel feeder eating corn. When you spot a, a raccoon, the eyes glow real, real bright. And this here didn't did have no shine to it. And that's what kind of told me, I, we're, I don't know what we got here, because the eyes didn't shine. And that was really strange, but also, the next night it was back again. I didn't know what to think. I, 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 I looked at that thing, I'd never seen anything like it. I know it's ugly, <laughs> very ugly. He's got a long nose, something similar to what we have. You know, it's just something I've never seen before. Like I said, I've lived here most of my life and had never seen anything like this. I live right up the hill here about uh, three or 400 yards. She called my house one day and said, hey, we got a funny looking animal out here. And uh, so I came down, I was, uh, a little shocked because, like I say, I've never seen anything quite like this before. When I was a little girl growing up, we've always heard of the myth of chupacabra. And I said, kind of jokingly, I said, well, I don't know. It looks like a baby chupacabra. Since this happened, so many people have told us that they have been seeing them. This is a hot spot for the sightings and the people that shoot them within a 15 mile radius of Ratcliffe here. Ratcliffe has about 20 houses, 100 residents, and no industry. 10 kilometers from this hamlet lies the town of Cuero with 6,700 inhabitants and a 200 year history. Wayne Addix, a retiree who serves as president of the local Heritage Museum, is passionate about his city's heritage. The mission of the museum is to tell the story of the history of Cuero and tell about its people. Cuero is a very volunteering town. Many people are here doing things to make the town a better place. There's a regular group that meets at the Dairy Queen there's uh, people who meet at the Wild Turkey in the evening. We do have our places where you can go get a good beer. There's, of course, church. Quarrel is a very religious-based community. And we probably have over 30 churches in the town. Uh, the county itself is a major, major producer of beef, one of the largest shippers of beef in the country. Many of them are long-term family ranches. Some areas of the country, they've been taken over by big corporations. Uh, here, they're still mostly family ranches. Ratcliffe and Cuero are a part of DeWitt County, an area of 910 square kilometers that has gradually become the playground of the terrifying chupacabra. Most of the sightings have come from this area. The chupacabra has been reported from Puerto Rico to Maine. <laughs> So it's not unique to this area. I would say that we seem to see more sightings than most places. No, I have not seen one myself. So I'm totally dependent on what's been published in the newspaper or on the web. You see the pictures of it. And when I first saw it, I thought, oh my goodness, that's really shocking to see. And they are pretty gruesome looking and pretty fierce looking. Wayne Addicts is not the only one to fear this terrifying creature. In DeWitt County, and especially in Cuero, the chupacabra is the subject of every conversation. On a ranch on the outskirts of Cuero, lives a true animal lover, Dr. Phyllis Canyon. 
certified nutritional consultant, doctor of naturopathic medicine, animal enthusiast, outdoorsman, and I love life. I hunt anywhere that I have a chance to. This is a Burchell zebra from Namibia. A zebra is a very, very difficult and very challenging animal. This is a bobcat that was taken on this ranch. In the beginning, I thought it's what was taking my chickens until I shot him one night. And the next night, a chicken was killed and he was dead. So then I knew I had something different. What frightening creature attacked Dr. Canyon's chickens? I came home and one of the chickens was dead. And it's like, now this is really bizarre that the chicken would have been left dead there. Any predator is going to pick the animal up and carry it off. All the prime meat is still on the chicken. The chicken was opened only in its thorax area. So I got a white rag and I dabbed the area and there was no blood on the rag. And I thought, oh my gosh. So what would kill the animal and really be only intense at drinking the blood or sucking the blood? After the seventh chicken I found in the exact same fashion, then I beginning to, began to ask the neighbors and immediately everyone said, oh my gosh, Dr. Canyon, that is the chupacabra. And I'm like, what, the chupa what? And they said, a chupacabra, it, that's a blood sucker. And he said, it's a chupacabra, you've never heard of this? And I'm like, I have no idea. And it's like, well, it's a goat sucker. And I'm like, a goat sucker? And he said, yes, it kills the animal by sucking the goat's blood. I never heard the word ever in my life. According to various testimonies, the chupacabra has a menacing canine jaw, sharp fangs to help suck the blood of its prey, black and gray skin, and red eyes, similar to those of the devil. Some claim the creature moves on two legs. Others believe they saw thorns covering its exterior. In short, a terrifying creature that bears no resemblance to known species in the region. In 2007, Dr. Canyon spotted a strange creature on her land, one that even she could not identify. It's like, whoa. First time I saw this beast was right out there where that little green tuft of grass is. It was about this time of the day, so the sun was really shining on it, and I could see it didn't have any hair. And it trotted off and went in between the house and the barn. And that was it. Just kept looking back at me along the way. And then I drove up and tried to go around to see if I could see where he went, and I couldn't. And it's like, O-M-G. And it's like, okay, who do I tell that to? We had just gotten back from Africa, and it's like, wow, we saw a lot of weird stuff in Africa, and none of it looked like that. And it's like, you know, this is something different. And then the story began. I didn't say anything to anyone because I thought, well, people are going to think I'm loony. Uh, my name is Emily Booker. My daughter Phyllis came across this, this strange animal. We don't know where it came from. She happened to see one of the first ones, and she's been interested in it ever since. I kept seeing an animal on the ranch that I did not know what it was. I didn't know why its behavior was what it was. But the more people that I told what was happening with my chickens, all told I lost 28, uh, they all kept saying the same word, chupacabra. And that's when I started to think, man, this is something really different, but why me? Am I the only one that's seeing it? Why on this ranch? Because this is nothing but ranch land around here. For Dr. Canyon, a lifelong hunter, there is one trophy missing from her collection. But one summer day, seven years ago. A neighbor rancher called me about seven o'clock one Saturday morning. And he said, hey, you know that animal that you've been seeing, that chupacabra? Somebody hit it on the road right in front of our ranch. Her luck suddenly changed. 
So I wanted to maintain the body so that we have it to always look at. And the smell is quite strong. And this is the tail that we preserved because the tail is so long and that is very, very unusual. Just a genetic disposition in that particular type of animal for sure. That is the real thing. This was the Phoenix newspaper. This was in the Houston Chronicle. News of the monster's corpse traveled around the world. Since that day, Phyllis Canyon has been nicknamed the Chupacabra Lady by the media. People hear about it and correspond with her about it and want to know more about it. School children write about it. It's just been phenomenal. My name is Amanda Brown. I'm an anchor producer and a reporter. Well, basically, uh, people started saying they've been seeing chupacabras on their land. And that's when, you know, news stories started popping up. And these are stories that will go nationwide, even international, because that's how much people are interested in them. And things have not been the same since. I'm an old newspaper woman, so <laughs> I save clippings of everything. And over the years, as you can see, it's just accumulated. And all of these clippings are from places all over the world. Do I have an animal background? No. I have been an outdoorsman all my life. And how I got deemed the Chupacabra Lady, I'm not sure if there is anyone that has done as much research into the animal and has had something to correlate some of its abnormalities to. And this has been going on for seven years, and, uh, and the interest has not waned one bit. People are still interested in the chupacabra. The picturesque town of Cuero was founded in 1870 thanks to the arrival of the railway. The perfect backdrop for a film, for a western, or for a horror movie. And even before the railroad got here, they started construction on housing and stores. And then as soon as the railroad arrived, business was going. And it became a uh, fairly rowdy town. There were up to, well, over 30 saloons. Gunfighters came to town. It was a rough and tumble place, which over time slowed down. But even into the 40s and 50s, the West Main was known as the tough area of town. All you have to do is walk down uh, Main Street and look at the buildings. It feels like walking in time. Uh, the town is filled with Victorian homes. Uh, many of these homes were built by ranchers whose family didn't want to live out on the ranch. They wanted to live in town and have the benefits of the, of the town. And just like in the Wild West, everything is possible, even monsters. Beginning in their childhood, locals hear about the chupacabra. So down in South Texas, you've heard of, I've heard about the chupacabra since I was a little girl. And you go to a you know, neighbor's house, oh, you better behave, a chupacabra will come get you. And you just are like, oh, okay, I don't, I'm just gonna stay inside when it gets dark. So. My name is Anthony Natardis. I'm the county extension agent for agriculture in DeWitt County. What I know in the chupacabra, I grew up in South Texas. I'm 46 years old, and I can remember hearing that as long as I've been alive. And I've seen different things, you know, where something will be in the newspaper or in, on TV of chupacabra sightings. Uh, I mean, the origins date back to the 1990s. In Puerto Rico, a bunch of goats and chickens were found dead. And I guess the farmer claimed that a chupacabra sucked the blood out of his animals, and that's kind of where it started, I feel like the first news story was reported sometime around that time. But from then on, I think stories started spreading and sightings of the El Chupacabra just kept going on and on and on. And media started covering more and more stories of these sightings. But how could this monster migrate from Puerto Rico to Texas? No one has found an answer to this puzzle. So how did it get here? Nobody knows. It is truly a very deep-seated mystery. The typical description around here is a, uh, 
a hairless, weird-looking canine. You know, that's what people are calling the chupacabra. People say it's a creature unlike they've ever seen before. You know, it's got sharp fangs, you know, long nails, you know, hairless. It's on four legs. It's, it's scary. And a lot of people in South Texas do believe in the chupacabra because there's a lot of farmers, a lot of ranchers that have livestock. You know, so they keep their guns with them, you know, just in case something runs along the field that they don't know and they will shoot it. Some people even have some stuffed in their houses. Stuffing and mounting a chupacabra? Who but Dr. Phyllis Canyon would undertake that? And if people made fun of me, yes. And they're like, really, Dr. Canyon? Really? A chupacabra? Give me a break. And then I say, you come look at it in my house, and you tell me what you think it is. Of all the things that we've had the pleasure in the challenge of hunting around the world, the chupacabra definitely brings in more questions than anything that we have hanging on the wall. This is it. We had the animal mounted in this form because this is how it always appeared to be walking. Animal or monster? According to Dr. Canyon, certain of its characteristics bear no resemblance to any other living animal. It appeared to have somewhat of a hump in its back. When we actually measured the legs, the front legs are about an inch and a half shorter than the back legs. These are the nodules that are on the rear end that we still do not know what they are. We don't know what the stripes on the leg are. It has two nipples here, but it does not have the back two. And that would be about as unusual as a human only having one breast. And we confirmed that when we actually taxidermied and took the hide off of the body. Uh, there were no mammary glands going there. So a very unusual feature and one that has been consistent on all four that we've come in contact with on this, in this ranch, in this area. One thing that we really didn't understand was why it has so much extra skin on the forehead part. The top mandible, you can see, is about an inch and a half longer than the bottom mandible. It's like, how can that be? Is that one of the reasons that maybe it craves blood and it does not crave the meat? That's just one of the mysteries that we just don't know. And then the blue eyes, and they are beyond blue. So again, we talk about not having any hair on it. As you can see, there's no hair anywhere on it. Yet, when you get the right angle, you can see the amount of fuzz that covers the body. But all of these features are extremely, and in some cases, almost bizarre with the nipples and the nodules on its butt end that we just don't see on animals anywhere that I have traveled and certainly on anything that we have in Texas. Pretty bizarre. The mystery continues. Despite the capture of what appears to be the body of a chupacabra, Dr. Phyllis Canyon continues to search for the monster, regularly walking the dirt roads of her ranch in hopes of catching one alive. I have been a hunter all my life. She started out uh, uh, hunting birds just when she was old enough to shoot a BB gun. Just a little BB gun. I mean, she could do worlds with that thing. And now they just, they just hunt the big stuff. And while my husband says, you know, we have to stop hunting, we just, our walls are full, I, I do see a lot of bare space. She's not afraid of anything. Uh, I always have a firearm with me because if we have a chance that there is something there that doesn't need to be there, then we shoot it. That's, that's just what we do in Texas, and I love that. It's great to do it. It's a relief buster. Well, I guess one of her favorite things is, is hunting chupacabras, but... We'll get the pistol. Very, very good at what she does. We'll get the rifle. And we'll be sure we have a full clip. Let's go. So we'll just drive around and see what we can find. It 
It was just a few meters from her home that she first laid eyes on this amazing creature. I'm going to take you and show you where I saw the chupacabra for the very first time. Well, this is the chupacabra pastures. Watch this. When they hear that, they know that I am here. Hi, girlies. When I saw them up in the front, the animals were around and they didn't seem to be bothered. Now, there are some animals that might scare it off, but that's what makes it really interesting. According to Dr. Canyon, patience and a keen sense of observation are the essential qualities of a good hunter. I can sit and watch animals for hours and their behavior. It, to me, is so fascinating. Well, I mean, you never know. When you hunt, you just never know. I mean, maybe you'll not see anything. Maybe you'll see something different. That's just the thrill of hunting. right there with her baby. That's a fawn. Maybe. Never know when you drive around what you may jump up. That's what we call jumping them up. Oh, there's jackrabbits. Look at them hopping off. How cute is that? I mean, when they put their ears back, they're hard to see. But according to some wildlife experts, Dr. Canyon's quest is futile. We're in an area here that's somewhat unique in that we're in a transition zone between the Gulf Coast prairies and what we call the South Texas brush. The habitat here changes, and so therefore we have a, a change in kind of wildlife. It's very diverse. As a result, you have things in nature where you have diseases that create chupacabras. That's fine for those people that you know, or into those mythical things, I think that's great. I think it brings a sense of uh, a little bit of notoriety to the area or the person, the particular person that found it. Uh, but again, there's been no science that has found that it is, in fact, some mythical creature. And I mean, after I saw it a couple of times, there was never a time that I was not always looking for it. I mean, I come up here and look around at all the tracks that are here and see what tracks are unusual and what tracks do we recognize. Because there'll be deer tracks and there are hog tracks and there are raccoon tracks. A lot of deer tracks. Yeah, always come around and just look and see if there's anything different, anything that we would not, that I usually don't see. And then you get a track like this that's actually different. Here, that's a big animal, whatever that is. You can see its toe prints with its toenails sticking there. That's really weird. That's big. And there's a giant snake going into the water right there. Wow. That's really cool. Sometimes you're lucky and sometimes you're not, so. You'll see when you go out to hunt, you never know. We've seen deer, we've seen snakes, we've seen the jackrabbit. All is missing is the chupacabra. Jackie and Arnold Stokes were luckier than Dr. Canyon. They actually managed to capture the beast that came prowling into their garden. But is it a chupacabra? I decided I'm gonna go ahead and try to trap it. It's just in me to do that. I'm just a sportsman when it comes to, to wildlife and stuff like that. This thing here, uh, it was different and I wanted it. I had a platform, went out to right here and that's uh, where I put the trap. 
They say that these things can jump high. I don't know, I've never seen one jump, but I've heard people say that they can really jump high. And uh, that night, about 11.30, 12 o'clock, we had it trapped. We couldn't believe it was that easy. <laughs> yeah. At ours, it looked like a small canine of, of sorts, you know. So I fed it dog food, and he loved it. My uncle caught one. Well, it got my attention. So I came out here with the kids, and sure enough, we saw the chupacabra. <laughs> and it was ugly. He would growl. Almost like a, like a dog's growl or something, you know. It... You wouldn't want to put your hand in the cage. I was kind of scared. And then here it is. And it hissed. It was just a weird sound. I was glad it was in the cage. For the first time in Texas history, a monster was captured alive. The media was quick to pick up the story. We took it to town, and the Quirrell Record, which is our newspaper in Quirrell, they come and took pictures of it and put it in the paper, and then... Uh, well, the word spread. Somebody said, well, it's been in New York. <laughs> and somebody said it was over in Korea, and then Vietnam, and someplace up in Montana. And uh, it just went everywhere. We had no idea that it was going to catch on like that. No idea. <laughs> it, it was something else. Oh, it was very much the talk of the town. You could go to any coffee shop or any place, any restaurant, and that was what individuals were visiting about. I just remember the article in the paper and the picture in the papers just stood out in my mind because it was so unique. At first I thought, well, maybe there is something to this chupacabra because that thing is alive and completely hairless and, uh, and it really looks like a different kind of animal. But was the frail creature captured by the Stokes a monster? He had a family actually catch in a live trap a critter, again, that was experiencing hair loss, kind of really strange, distorted looking uh, critter that was alive. And they called me and they're like, oh my gosh, we have a baby chupacabra. And as soon as I looked in it, it's like, well, that's not a chupacabra. And they're like, uh, but uh, I think it was determined that it was a raccoon or something like that that again had a severe case of sarcoptic mange. Travis Sharm, a veterinarian in Victoria, Texas. I've had a couple people, ranchers, that have shot what they thought might be a chupacabra, and they come in, and I, they bring it here, and they say, what do you think, Dr. Shar?" And I'll look at it, and I say, well, it looks like a mangy coyote. And so on one or two of them, I've actually done a little skin test, and sure enough, they've had sarcoptic mange. Mange is a name for the disease caused by a parasite, a mite, that gets down into the hair follicles, into the skin, and typically will cause the hair to fall out. Some people said it was a raccoon with mange. Well, I never once saw him scratch or act uncomfortable. The skin pigmentation on that thing was good. There, and it had no sores or no red spots or it did not scratch or anything to that effect, you know. So but that thing does not have mange. They put cat food in the cage and it actually picked it up and ate it with both hands, which is what a coon does, a raccoon. I'm like, I, I just, and they just didn't want to believe it. He had a growl, which the old coon hunters said was a sound unlike a raccoon makes. It's a raccoon. There's no two ways around it. He was at the Dairy Queen one morning in the back of the truck, and I have some friends that come out, and they all said that thing does not have mange. I'm thinking it could be something that's come over from Mexico. We were advised to not turn it loose, that we had to have it euthanized, which we did, humanely. <laughs> I, I don't know what I'm gonna do with that ugly thing. For her part, Dr. Phyllis Canyon is not giving up. 
she hopes to be the first to capture a real living chupacabra. Oh, the trap stayed up for about four years. When the animal goes in and steps on that, traps them. We caught a lot of stuff in it. We caught coons in it and possums in it and skunks in it. But the elusive chupacabra, that one is a challenge. So gives me more incentive to just keep looking and trying to figure it out and think, how can it be smarter than me? That's what I think a lot. We just keep looking for them. Although to date, no chupacabra has been captured alive, here in Texas, people continue to believe in them. Because day after day, the people of South Texas continue to spot unusual creatures on their land. What's going on in this region? The reason why we're seeing so many maybe in this area is just the landscape of the county in this part of the state has changed. Because the oil and gas activity where we have a lot of land that's being pushed down in oil well instead of brush, it's now an oil well. So I think it's probably dispersed. The wildlife population probably does explain some, you know, the fact that there's more sightings. The oil industry has only started to become so affluent within the past three years. This happened seven years ago when there was not much oil around here. Do I believe that has something to do with it? No. Now, could you have a mutation? Yep. But a mutation could be one in a million. I have seen four of these within four days. That's not a mutation. Are there any facilities anywhere within our ranch, 150 miles, that perhaps have contaminated water? No, nothing anywhere in sight. It would have affected our deer population and our coyote population and our wolf population that we see right now, and they all still look the same. The other change would be the environmental conditions have changed. We've been in and out of a drought now for probably 10 years or more. We've had droughts followed by a lot of rain. I think maybe environmental conditions have caused these mites that cause the Sarcoptic mains to thrive. For Anthony Natardis, the mystery has a simple solution. If I recall back then in 2007, Phyllis actually contacted my office as well as the game biologist and the game warden in this area. And all of us said the same thing, that this was probably uh, just, a, again, a coyote that was out there or a fox that had a severe case of mange. Are these guys buffoons? A fox? A fox body is this big. So it's not a fox, you guys. This animal is huge. And this mange kept coming up. But every picture that I came across actually showed patches of hair missing. So typically when you have mange due to skin mites, the skin will look diseased because number one, the hair's out, number two, they've scratched, number three, they get a bacterial infection, so they get scabby, flaky, inflamed, abnormal looking skin. As you can see, there's no hair anywhere on it, yet when you get the right angle, you can see the amount of fuzz that covers the body. And again, that would not be indigenous with an animal that actually has mange. But nor did the skin look like it was infected. Nowhere did it look like it had mange. Why are the eyes so brilliant blue? Why does the front leg appear to be shorter than the back leg? Why is the top mandible longer than the bottom mandible? You know, that disease, as it en enrages the body in advanced forms, can really distort the, the look of the, the hide, the skin, facial features. Uh, so they're really scary. And I can see how people would, you know, latch on to a story and call it a chupacabra or whatever else they want to call it. Some people are absolutely convinced that there is a different kind of animal out there. Others are not. I'm one of those probably who's not convinced. What it would take for me to believe in the chupacabra is scientific evidence. It would take some reputable biologists to tell me that uh, their DNA and all is different. 
Looking for absolute proof, Dr. Phyllis Canyon decided to submit the carcass of her dead chupacabra to the ultimate test, DNA analysis. So I contacted UC Davis, University of California in Davis, California. They are the largest forensics animal university in the United States and said, I have an animal that I want to do DNA on. So after about eight weeks, they called me and they said, we have the results in. And are you sitting down? And I'm like, yes, I am. After eight weeks, Dr. Canyon received the DNA analysis results. The findings were startling, to say the least. They said, this is a mix between a coyote on the maternal side and a Mexican wolf on the paternal side. And how does that happen? Because those two do not breed. So the DNA does not match anything in your annals of history with DNA in animals, and they're like none. Can a wolf and a coyote breed? Some say yes, some say no. So, um, and I think it's plausible. Dr. Shar also conducted analyses to determine if the creature had scabies. Most common reason we see dogs without hair is because of mites. And so you diagnose that by doing a, a true biopsy where we cut a piece of that skin off. And we sent that skin to an official pathology lab. And the result? And they did not find any type of mites, skin mites. But if the animal had no skin disease, how do we explain its lack of hair? And can this hybrid beast really drain the blood of its prey? They cannot suck the blood. It is not, it is not anatomically possible. They can bite them, in particular, if they bite them on the neck, obviously, because you have the carotid and the jugular, which are your major blood vessels. And number one, it's a very vulnerable place for fighting. And then when they cut those or bite those, that blood's going to squirt out. They can sit there and lick and consume the blood by licking it which a lot of animals like blood. I mean, it's, a, it's supposed to be a very palatable protein. You know, people eat blood. I mean, there's blood, blood sausage that people eat. So I think that is their meal of choice, maybe, is this blood, is why they, I look at it. So do I believe there is uh, an animal without hair that's a little few different features and it wouldn't be named a chupacabra? Name it a chupacabra is my scientific thought. I think that's a perfect name for this if it is indeed a new breed, which if there is a coyote wolf cross, what do you want to call it? You want to call it a coyote wolf? Call it a coyote wolf. You want to call it a chupacabra? Name it a chupacabra. A new species or a mythical monster? In Cuero, opinions are divided. Do I believe? I believe anything is possible. Do we call it something different or do we call it what that name is? As a professional in the business, we just know it as a fun thing for people to have fun with as a mythical creature. It's hard because that name is so tied with being a mythical animal. It's kind of like the boogeyman. I'm the type of person I like to believe in folklore and myths. I still believe in Santa Claus and Tinkerbell. <laughs> because we see, have seen a number of them, and a number of them have been killed, hit by cars, and so forth, uh, there are a lot of people who believe they are a different animal. I saw them. I know they exist, whatever this was. It's just not enough data for me to uh, give a coherent answer, to be honest. And we know it's not a dog, and that it's not a mangy coyote or a mangy wolf, but what is it really? The mystery continues. So as long as no one says this isn't a chupacabra, you can't really say. You can't really say which one, who is right. You can't really say. Cuero and the surrounding plains have more to offer than the hunt for the chupacabra. A lot of the tourists who come to this community are looking for heritage because of the history of the city of Cuero and DeWitt County, because we can go back to the 1830s and the 1840s. Uh, you have a lot of people who are coming in to do some hunting and fishing. The Cuero Heritage Museum is expanding. And this museum is full of curiosities. 
Upstairs is, as far as I know, the world's largest collection of juice reavers in a museum. And in fact, I think it's the only significant collection in any museum. The oldest is probably this one. It's the first patented juice reaver in the United States. We have probably 5,000 individuals who come in the springtime and enjoy the wildflowers of DeWitt County. Quarrel is the wildflower capital of Texas, and the surrounding area is just filled with fields of color. We have 10 to 12,000 people who come in in October to enjoy Turkey Fest and all of those activities and watch the turkeys race. And so that's a big celebration in October. It's quite an event. But of course, the chupacabra remains an iconic figure. There's a reputation out there about the chupacabra. It's spread out. So we get people who have come here specifically looking for a chupacabra. Uh, so it's helped the tourism. It's helped our reputation. I also saw a lot of people who came into the community to look for the chupacabra, and they walked away with a t-shirt and maybe a, a cup of coffee. I know one lady in our area in Cuero, she sells shirts that say the chupacabra on it. All righty. To, to everywhere, people, I mean, in different countries are interested. I won't say it's a major impact, but it is definitely an impact. I think that uh, those sightings by those individuals were, uh, in their minds, very real. They, they've broadened our horizons. They've uh, brought us to another uh, threshold of education about mythical creatures, as well as the possibility that some animals may be uh, different because of their environment. The legend of the chupacabra has left its mark on Cuero. And as for Dr. Canyon, her encounter with the monster changed her life. You know, this has been seven years since I first saw the chupacabra. So for me, the questions always continue, and the quest to find out what it is will never end. 